The grace and peace of Christ be with you, friends. And thank you for taking some time to gather with us for worship via a desktop sermon from wherever you are, whenever you are. Today's message is given for St. James's United Reformed Church on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, the 1st of October, 2023. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 through 32, which I invite you to read, but which I will also read now. Let us open our hearts and, indeed, our entire being to the word and wisdom of God. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Amen. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this story comes to us after Jesus has entered Jerusalem on a colt, where people lie in the streets waving the branches of trees and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. The city was in turmoil at his arrival, with the officials asking, Who is this? And the crowds responding, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now authorities never like to be surprised. When Jesus entered into the city making a lot of noise, he surprised those who were officially a power. He only surprised those who were officially in power. To ordinary people who longed for justice and hope, his arrival was long expected. He then went into the temple and cleansed it, overturning tables of money changers and quoting Isaiah 56, verse 7, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Even the children began singing as he approached the temples, uh, fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 8, out of the mouths of babes. Jesus was upsetting the delicate balance of how the authorities, both the civic but also the religious ones, had maintained a place of worship in the middle of the rapacious violence behind the Roman Empire. But what they had achieved in this balance seemed to be the creation of a place of worship devoid of God. There seemed to be no encounter with the divine there. There seemed to be no hope for the hopeless there. Jesus' critique was that it was a place of lukewarm compromise, a place where the possible was possible and the impossible was talked about, but never encountered. Stanley Hauerwas, an American theologian, writes, The chief priests and the elders of the people challenged him, asking not only by what authority he has to teach, but also Who gives him the right to cleanse the temple, cure the blind and lame in the temple, provide for the poor, and start a children's choir? They believed they had the authority to do these things. 
but this rabble-rouser from Nazareth, of all places, is actually doing them, even though it hasn't been happening in God's own house of prayer with the proper authorities in place. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you that authority? Theirs is a trick question. For if Jesus defers his authority to anyone else but him, he will betray who he is. This question still trips us up today. Who gives Jesus authority? Who gives Jesus' church today any authority to do anything? By what authority do we do anything? And the answer is that any response we give that is not grounded in the life of Death and resurrection of Jesus results in idolatry. How do we know these things are true? We cannot prove any of them scientifically or historically. If we could, we should worship that instead. There is no place we can go to know with certainty that Jesus is who he says he is. It's the same today as then. To know that Jesus is the Son of God requires that we take up the cross and follow him. Their answer about John's authority we do not know is the same for us with one exception. Do we rest in that unknowing, or do we take up our cross and find out? Now what does it mean to take up the cross? Jesus makes his point clear with the chief priests and elders by giving them a trick question of their own to answer, a parable of two sons. One son says he won't go into the vineyard and work, but later decides... He must. The other said that he will go, but then does not. Who does the will of the Father? Jesus' implication is clear. The faith leaders have not done their work, and because of this, they are more concerned with threats to their authority and how things are supposed to be done, rather than a transformational encounter with the living God. The children in the temple recognize Jesus and form a choir, but the priests form an inquiry. How sad. How sad it is to live without an openness to wonder. For without an openness to awe and wonder, how can we give praise? And how can we be in awe when it appears right in front of us? The tax collectors and the sex workers, whose harsh life experiences had taught them not to put their faith in human institutions upheld by so-called decent society embedded in the religious communities, were transformed in their encounter with the living gospel who is Jesus. In wonder, they let their lives be transformed. They dropped their cynicism and their fear. They picked up their cross. And what is that cross? It is whatever you fear. It is whatever you think will cause you death, the end. It is whatever you think you cannot recover from. For Jesus, it was an implement of cruel imperial torture, a painful public humiliation that was supposed to condemn him to being nothing more than the dead and decaying body of a common criminal or rabble-rouser who failed to follow the rules and be a decent Roman subject. What is it for you? Whatever it is, That is your cross to bear. But you don't bear it alone, just as even Jesus did not bear that cross alone. You follow Jesus, the Christ, the Lord of life, who has been through death and resurrection, and you do it as part of a church, a community that is the living body of Christ today, a gift of the Holy Spirit to the world. Yes, you are a part of God's gift to the world. You participate when you pick up your cross, when you face your fears or inadequacy or shame or bad things you have done, and your encounter with Jesus transforms. Indeed, as a church, we should be a place of encounter with the living Christ who does transform. And if we don't think we are, indeed every community needs to re-encounter that transformation without fear, then let us pray and follow the Spirit by picking up our own cross and following Christ. For this is to do God's will, even if we have said no before, and it won't lead only to death. It goes through death, to resurrection, 
and the being with God that is beyond anything we can begin to imagine. Alleluia. Amen.